Okay, welcome back. We're going to have a quick um, tutorial and problem solving set, uh, session on the sign rule. So, a uh, quick reminder that the sign rule is um, a rule that relates two opposite pairs. So, we take an angle and its opposite side, and we consider that to be a pair, a triangular pair, if you like. Okay, we should be talking about, well, let's investigate what page we might expect this to be on in your tables. So, we're going to trigonometry and out to page, does that read 13? Yeah, read about ter 13. There's no about about it, but having said that, there's so much trigonometry going on here that um, it's page 16 by the time we see it. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a... A quick proof of the sine rule. Prerequisite knowledge for this proof are the central angle theorem. Okay, quick reminder that when you support a an angle on an arc, that the inscribed angle within the circle, this is the inscribed angle, is equal to half the central angle. Okay, so what we're going to consider is that every single triangle can be fitted into some circle called a circumcircle. Remember now, we're, this is the proof. Circumcircle. Okay, and and this is general. These, these, these could be moved anywhere. So just because my diagram there looks quite like a, an equilateral angle, I don't want to give you any false impressions. Um, now it's best to you, you can use dynamic software and I'll be share, uh, sharing a link with you on certain resources I share with you. But just as a general guideline, it's nice to put one of these points. This this will be the the um, where the angle is, one point well to the left and one point slightly to the left. But there's no particular reason why the center of the circle needs to be inside the angle. It could, it could also be outside the angle. Okay, and everything I'm about to say will still be true and indeed I'll, de I'll, de I'll depict it here to, to convince you. So basically what we're thinking about doing is thinking about this isosceles triangle here and dropping and dropping a, a, an altitude. When you drop an altitude down via a um, isosceles triangle you interact with the, or you intersect the, the far side at right angles. And therefore, the, an altitude is always, dropping an altitude is always a bisector of the angle. That means this angle equals this angle, and then have a look, have a look, have a look, oh lovely. That means this angle and this angle are the same. And if I'm depicting this as side A, then I, as angle A, then I need to depict, the, this is how we generally do it, as is done here, we generally depict the side opposite A as side A. And that would mean that the opposite side itself is A over 2, because of course the altitude bisects that line segment here, that side of the triangle. Okay, so now let's just apply the idea of the ratio for sine of A is of course a over 2 divided by the radius of the circle. Now the radius of the circle is not related directly anyway, it's not related to the sides. Okay, we could have put those sides, we could have put side 1, side 2, and side 3, or side A, B, and C, and made them completely different measurements. So R is not related, but we will find that it, has, it plays a fantastic role in a, in, a, in, a, in a little bit when I finish my proof here. Okay, so we tidy that up because fractions shouldn't have three layers in them. Okay, it should be a two a two layered cake only. So we have one over two R. And true high in sight, and just believe me, just, just please go with, roll with me here. So I'm gonna say that two R is equal to A over the sine of A. Okay, and in particular, this two R is independent of how I pick my points. So I can use the exact same circle and pick different points. 
And so any, this is a phenomenal situation, any angle, any side divided by the sine of its opposite side will always be equal to the diameter of the circumcircle, because of course 2r is the diameter of the circumcircle. But of course there's no particular reason why we couldn't do this whole thing with side b, with angle b. So that would also come out to be equal to b over sine b, and that would also come out to be c, little c, side c, over sine of c. And we like it because we have a dimension of distance here and a dimension of distance here, distance here, and distance here. Okay, and the whole thing can be flipped upside down. What I would particularly like about this proof is that it doesn't only give us the sine rule, but it also tells you that each one of these is equal to the diameter of the circle circle. So what should we do now? Pause, think. What kind of play, what kind of exploration should we do? Before we go any further, we should try to find some special cases. We should try and convince ourselves that it's true. So what are the special cases? Well, let's go to the very first theorem that ever existed in mathematics, Tal's theorem, which is that we have see a diameter here, um, any, any angle um, inscribed within that semicircle would be a right angle. Okay, so how does this play out for us here? Well, the angle is right angle, the opposite side is really a diameter, um, but let's just call it 2a for a moment. And then according to this, we're going to get the side length, which is 2a, uh, a. just for now we'll, say we'll play ignorant, okay? And yes, it, it happens to be going through the centre, and yes, that's a, a denominator, but let's play ignorant for a second, and say this side here is a, and it's being divided by the sine of 90 degrees. And according to my theory here, that should be equal to twice the radius of the circumcircle. But there's the circumcircle here, there's the radius, and there we go, because the sine of 90 is, of course, 1. So that's lovely. That's just a, a special case. But it does, it does, it's reassuring, and it is essential that that would happen. Okay. So, um, let's consider how it plays out in problem solving. So there's only two things you can do with the sine rule. You can make one of these four quantities unknown. Okay, there's four quantities here. There's an A and there's a sine of A and a B and a sine of B. But that's effectively making one. If you know sine of A, you know A, or at least you could know two possibilities for it sometimes in the ambiguous case. But generally, uh, more about that in a moment. But if you know the A, you know the sine of A. Okay? So basically, you want one unknown. And what these form are opposite pairs. So we're going to get down to a few problems. Um, ba -ba -ba. In your book, this will be page 295, if I haven't just assigned it to you assignment, as an assignment in one note. Okay, so we'll throw that away now and get started. So some of it will be really basic. So here we go, and they're starting off with a diagram which makes life easy for us. So here they're giving us two angles, 62 degrees, 41 degrees, and 15. So they're giving us two angles. This is valid in the sense that this triangle is allowed because their sum is not bigger than 180. That's about it. As long as these are not bigger than 180, you're not going to have a problem. We'll play devil's advocate and make up some stupid triangle in a second. It doesn't exist and we'll see, what, see how, how, how things go wrong. Like we'll make this 100 and we'll make this 90. More about that later on. Okay, so the question will be... I can tell you right now because I'm in the middle of a sign a, a sign rule question. This is going to be what they ask me. So you can study it all you like, but that's what's going to find length P or P to R. Okay. A bit annoying having to track everything there. This is this is this is at the end of the day. This is what we're talking about. So we'll always want to put our unknown here, and you'll always want to know the way this pans out, or the way you the way you use this theorem is you head off to the opposite side and you talk about its sign. But before I do that, I always want to write out the sign rule. Okay, so you always want to get in here and just write this sign rule from page 16. It's just a good habit. Okay, now, sure enough, as you get more and more mature and more and more competent, you might start skipping it. But but right now you're only learning and it's really important that you you write this. And you can just write it the first two bits of it, because how we, 
how we uh, think about what angles are what. They'll only be two pairs at any time. Okay, so write the first two bits of that. It's your first move. Now substitute in x over sine of 41 degrees equals 15 over the sine of 62 degrees. So think of it as um, as um, a crisscrossy choppy thing here where you're going from side to angle equals side to angle except you're taking their sine. Okay, now we cross multiply. And while we're at it, I just want to see what that does look like um, in a, what does that cross multiplying look like um, literally? And when I say literally here, I'm not talking about English literally, I'm talking about when we're using letters. So literally, what it looks like is that A is equal to B sine A over sine of B. Now in terms of remembering this and taking a shortcut and fast tracking into it, all I want you to say is you appreciate that you're talking you're talking about two pairs one of them remaining one of the um quantities remaining unknown and being solved for but most importantly once you've decided what you're solving for if it's a side yes you're going to have a kind of cross in your product here between the two letters as in Okay, we put C, B, and A here as it appears in your log tables, and A and B and big C here as angles. Well, if you're getting A, I just want you to look at how this physically looks. They're adjacent to each other. Okay, it's an adjacent pair. So what you could do is cross out the pair that mean nothing, that aren't involved. And then think whatever you want, think about the adjacent pair. And we go one step further. Let's say I wanted the sine of B. Okay, well let's look for an adjacent pair. It's here. Okay. So the sine of B will be equal to B sine A over B. And notice Something wrong here, isn't it? It's the sine of B over B over A here. Okay, now let's figure out what happened there. Okay. So when I have an A here, so there's a new, there's an extra way of looking at this if you want to be kind of a, 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 a get a further insight into it. When I have an A here, I want definitely to be talking about a B over sine B because that goes with this, and I want to think of it this way. I think you'll get my drift now as we go along here. And when I have a sine of B here. I, I want a sine of A over A. Notice we flip things upside down in terms of, um, you know, that's going to dominate. And then we're going to have B, which has come up, come up from cross multiplying. But essentially you have A is proportional to sine A through this particular factor, which is somewhat dynamic, if you understand what I mean. And that, so A is proportional to sine of A and sine of B is proportional to B, okay? And now when it comes to this, you definitely want signs cancelling with signs or numbers cancelling with numbers, if you know what I mean, again. Okay, so you should be practicing this. You should be pausing and saying, okay, that's kind of cool. So w one way or the other, you can always go back to the original formula. But, and this is where we're just going to bring in extra letters to see, just, just, just enrich and play around with this. And again, lots of pausing and lots of doing this. So let's see how how we can t leave the trigonometry arena and move into the algebraic arena um, and still 
operate with huge confidence. So for example, if I want P and don't worry about the capital and the small because it's quite you can tell the context from the sign. So if I want P, I'm because it's talking about Q. And I'm definitely talking about, but I'm talking about proportional to sine P. Now, when it comes to figuring out what the hell am I doing with Q, it's I have to cancel out the sign up there with the, with the sign down here. So basically, these P's and Q's kind of cancel out because they're at either side of the equals. And this sign of Q, the signs sort of cancel out in that they're at the top and bottom of a fraction bar. So guys, we're really learning maths here in a wonderful way, but I'm learning it here with you, and that's the great thing about investigating maths and really getting getting in, 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 enriched with the subject and discovering it. So I'm going to switch it around now. We're going to talk about getting the sign of any letter. Let's, use this. Let's go to sign a Q and ignore this. Or I can throw in two new letters if you want. Let's throw in two new letters in case I start um, operating from within this. No cheating. Okay. So, and by the way, while we're at it, let's look at the letters of the alphabet that have nice and distinct capitals and small. C is useless. D is good. E is okay. F is not great. A, B, C, D, E, F, G is good. Although we reserve that for functions, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, reserve for functions, I, rubbish, J, rubbish, K, rubbish, H, I, J, K, L, rubbish, M, it's okay, but it's not great, L, M, N, well, we could use N a bit better, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, R is great, S, T, T is great, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Okay, so let's just concentrate on using these letters um, for situations where we need a small and a cap that are quite distinct. Okay, so